Hey folks, uh, my name is Jake. I'm a brewer here at Grunfell, and I'm also in charge of the canning operations here. Um, I'd like to apologize in advance in case there's a little bit of an echo. We're actually in our uh, homebrewing room where we keep a lot of the small batch experiments and stuff that are done personally uh, by the employees here. Um, and our plan for the day is to kind of just go over those, uh, walk you through um, what we're working on, what we're thinking about, a little bit about the process um, and the status of each thing. We've got about nine to go through. And if at any point you have questions or anything, you can submit them somewhere um, and we'll answer them uh, most likely at a later date. We'll compile a list of those things and try and answer as many as possible. Um, so yeah, let's get started. The first thing I'm going to show you today is uh, something we started working on as a brew team a while ago, actually, in December. This was we were planning on uh, making a holiday meal for uh, staff here, and the idea was to do a gingerbread moche. Um, so the thought was, why don't we? take some of the spare honey that we have, we'll caramelize it, um, we'll get a really nice rich flavor profile on it, and we'll add some spices to it and try and emulate the ginger bread. Uh, and give everyone a bottle just as a holiday gift. So that's exactly what we did. We started with some of our leftover honey. We put it uh, in a pot and caramelized it at 230 degrees for about 30 minutes. Um, it wasn't the, we're using the mash and boil setup. Um, which is made for beer. And so it has a temperature protection setting on it where it will only allow you to get to 230, and any higher than that, it will shut off. So that's as high as we could go. Uh, we did it for as long as possible. Um, and I think if we were to do it again, we could have gone a little bit darker on the caramelization, uh, just to bring out some of those like, sort of molasses cooked notes that we're looking for in the gingerbread. Um, the yeast choice on this was SO4. Um, Sapphire USO4 or SO4 rather. Um, the choice was made for that to express some of the fruity and floral notes um, and to also just have something that flocculates out really well so you could have a quick turnaround, um, clear need to get to people. Unfortunately, that didn't really happen. Uh, we've been really taking our time with it. The fermentation was a little bit more sluggish than we were expecting, I think, due to the temperatures uh, in this room. Uh, this is all it's used for, and so it doesn't always uh, get hit with a lot of heat. Um, we are also shooting for about 12% on this, or sort of a celebratory holiday wine. Um, Do you want to talk about some of the spices we put in to... Yeah, we had uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove. We didn't do cardamom, did we? We did a little, yeah. We did a little cardamom, right. that's right. Um, and we did that in a tea, so we boiled mm -hmm. that. Um, or 30 minutes or something like that. Uh, strained out all the spices and poured it in. That was our first edition. Um, and shortly there, shortly, you know, after the present, we're going to do a second edition, make sure things are nailed, um, and then give it out and, and age it until the next holiday season. Um, so yeah, that's that's number one. Oh okay, yeah, sure. Here, take the stool. The next thing, this is going to be a little bit, I guess, less exciting to look at since it's in a bucket. <laughs> but our uh, shipping manager, Chris, uh, was interested in making some meat and wanted to give it a shot. So he came to the brew team and kind of uh, told us what he was envisioning. And we started trying to work that back. Um, he wanted to do something similar to what we were talking about with the gingerbread. He wants a cinnamon vanilla meat. He wants it high ABV, like 15%. Um, pretty hot like that, and then we'll slap it in some wine bottles for him. So for this, we used uh, leftover honey as well. We love to be able to do that if there's stuff that we just can't, on a large scale, get into the tank just because of the way our equipment works. It's always nice to be able to save that and still use it instead of throwing it away. So this ended up being uh, a starting gravity of 1107. Um, which I think will get us down to around 14 and a half to 15% APD for Chris. And the yeast choice on this was DB10, um, just like a solid workhorse yeast. Uh, 
sort of really excited about the using it in, in kind of that like late harvest wine high indie thing. Um, and upon tasting it, a couple weeks ago, we were really happy with where it was. It was tasting uh, at, at that higher ABV, we were expecting it to be a little bit hotter than it was. And so I think the yeast did a really great job, especially at the cooler temperatures and they're making a nice clean fermentation. And I think it will take the spices that we decide to add to it, most likely in the same tea uh, method that we use for the gingerbread. Um, I think it will take those spices really well. Do you want to talk a little bit about why we do the tea rather than having them soak right in the yeah the um, difference between the two techniques? Yeah, so we, I think we do a lot of the um, tea because we like to kind of taste it and alter uh, our spice load as we go. We can always add more tea. We can always alter the proportions of uh, each spice with each tea addition. Um, it's something that we could do to a little bit easier and a little bit safer um, if we had a, an easier way to pull out a sample from a bucket. So we could throw a bunch of cinnamon sticks and vanilla in there for Chris um, and taste it every day and then uh, move, remove the cinnamon sticks right at the perfect level. Um, but just the fact that we're doing this at work, we're doing it when we have spare minute, we're doing it on lunch break, um, we're doing it before or after work when we can get the team in. And then we don't want people opening them up all the time, exposing to oxygen. So we're doing it thoughtfully in uh, tea additions. We can hit the top of CO2 if necessary to uh, remove some of that oxygen. Cool. The next thing, I've got three carboys here. I'll just bring up, well, I'll bring up the big one and then the other two are the same. This is a wine kit that I was working on. Uh, this is a, this is the Washington Merlot wine kit from I think it's like RJS uh, wine kits. And the goal here was to make, I, I'm a big red wine fan. I like it much more than red wine. I like a like big fruity red wine. So I went with Merlot just because it's pretty standard. And then the yeast choice on this was RC212, specifically to drive those really big, very fruity flavors. Um, and the kit comes with a concentrated uh, wine must. It comes with wine skins and stems, like a, you know, I don't know, just like pulverized wine skins and stems. And it comes with oak chips. And I, like I said, really wanted to drive home the big fruity um, berry characteristics. So I decided to just forego the oak, save it for if I felt it was necessary after bulk um, or after some aging. Um, and I added the skins and stems, let them uh, sit in there during primary for about a week, where I removed them and then. Uh, in addition to doing that, to doing those things, I, I didn't water it down as much as the kid suggested. I wanted something that was a little hot, um, a really big wine, so it's going to go up 14.5%. So starting gravity on this was 11.05. They had a pH of 3.04 after uh, a month of fermentation. Uh, and yeah, in, in preliminary testing, I'm really happy with where it's at. Um, it kind of takes after where I want it to, and I don't think I'm going to add the oak. I don't think it needs sort of that rounding character that oak will bring, or sort of those vanilla e notes. I want something fun, but intense, fruity berries, and I think that this is it. I have also just been like, kind of, like sampling and like drinking as I go. So it was five gallons, and it's, it's now done. This is a three gallon part of these are each one. So, um, what am I at? Four and a half gallons. So, yeah. Is getting gentle. The next thing is a really fun project. Um, this is, well, let me give a little bit of a story first. So my family does a, a family vacation every summer. Um, we're from Rhode Island and we've got like a little beachside house down there that my great, with my great aunts. And so we go and spend a week there every summer. Um, there happens to be for some reason, on this island, just a load of pear trees and a load of apple trees. So these are 
wild foraged pears and apples that I picked myself, pressed, like ground, pressed, um, and then fermented just, you know, I didn't add any yeast in it. Oh, it looks like we lost them. Um, I will be in contact with the brewers, but please stand by until we can get them back. I don't know what happened. Hello, everybody. Our littlest mead maker is here eating a cheese stick. Um, technical difficulties. So... Thanks, Brian. LOL is exactly right. Um, he is, uh, I hope, when Jake comes back, he tells you, oh, they're back. They're back. They're back. Pull them in, kid. Does Jake, right. does Jake well, know that he disappeared? <laughs> uh, pull the camera a little closer so we can hear Jake a little better. There we go. Sorry. That's okay. And also, Jake, you were being, um, I don't even know what the word is. Tell them just how much hand grinding you did to make that small batch. It's absurd. It is absurd. Um, yeah, I've, I've been through a couple different iterations of my process on grinding fruit for pressing. Um, the grinder that I have now is a hand crank grinder that probably should be secured to a much heavier object so it doesn't like to fuck around. Um, but basically, I mean, it, in general, it takes about 20 pounds of apples to get a gallon of cider. So I'll be sitting there with my hand crank grinder trying to make a five gallon batch of cider with 100 pounds of apples, basically bear hugging the grinder so I can push it against my body so it stops knocking around and just sitting there outside cranking, like cursing the world away. <laughs> As I'm cranking, and it takes me to do, uh, I have a five gallon press, and it takes me like 30 minutes to grind all the apples to fill the press once. Um, it takes me another 15 minutes to press, and another 15 minutes to change over to the next pressing. So it takes me an hour for every pressing in general, and it takes me about five pressings to get a five gallon back. So it'll be like a five hour day of just like sitting there, having washed all the apples cranking everything, sweating profusely, and then, you know, this is what you get from it. It's very re rewarding. Many Saturdays yeah. I come in to find Jake in here pressing away. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, previous, prior to that, though, I was using a uh, sausage attachment for a KitchenAid. <laughs> um, so the KitchenAid is nice because it would, it would, you know, it would turn for you, but I had to chop all the apples up into at least quarters to get them to fit into the like sausage grinder intake. Um, and it would also grind them super fine. So I don't know. I'm constantly working on it, making it a, a better experience for me uh, and for anyone who decides to help out. Um, but yeah, this is this is a wild pear uh, and apple mead essentially. Uh, it's about six percent potential and had a pH of 4.02 when I started it. Okay, let's move to the next thing. Ricky, is it worth going over anything that I already did because it was hard to hear? We'll do that later if we have to. <laughs> the next thing that I've got here is a bit of an experiment. Um, this is something that I find pretty fun to do and pretty fun to taste out. Um, this is essentially the same base must, the same uh, mixture of honey and water to an original gravity of 1050, um, with the same amount of yeast, the same nutrient, uh, same nutrient load. Uh, the only difference being the way in which the ingredient was added. Uh, and in this case, the ingredient is shag bark, hickory bark. Um, Hold it up, see if you can show. See a bit of the color difference between the two, a bit of the clarity difference. Um, essentially, the 
Jack bark, hickory bark can be used to make um, a product similar to maple syrup. You go out, you forage the bark. Um, since it's a shag bark, pieces will be hanging off naturally or will have fallen. Um, and those are, those are easy enough to break off. And since they're already um, hanging off the tree, they're no longer protecting the inner bark. And so it doesn't hurt the tree as long as you're not peeling bark off, you're breaking pieces off that are already uh, exposed. And what you can do is you take this bark, you clean it up, you toast it in the oven. It has this wonderful vanilla, uh, like toasted oak uh, aroma to it. And then you make a tea out of that and you boil it for 30 minutes to an hour or you simmer it for that long. Um, you concentrate that tea and then you add uh, sugar into it to make a sort of like tree syrup, similar to maple syrup, but with, I don't know, obviously just a completely different um, aroma and flavor. And it's really great stuff, but I wanted to see the effects that uh, it would have on a mead. I really like oak uh, in a mead and I really like maple in a mead. So uh, this was an experiment to try and suss out the best way to encourage those flavors to show through. Um, and so SB1, shag bark one, is the process where the, the bark was all toasted together um, for the same amount of time pulled out, uh, weighed, and then obviously it broke it out into two equally uh, weighed portions. One of them was boiled for 30 minutes and the liquid that was boiling in and the bark was added to uh, SV1. And SV2 straight out of uh, toasting, so, you know, sanitized, you know, it's, it's been roasting and toasting for an hour, it's, it's clean. Um, and that was put straight into SV2, so no oil involved. And I wanted to just see the difference in flavor uh, coming across in those two methods. I'm expecting to get, I don't know, like more tannins, maybe a richer flavor out of the boiled bark, um, and then maybe more of a more subtle thing from SV2. And I think maybe maybe once we go over the rest of the, the last three things, maybe we can taste them. Mm. I forgot my wine keep at home, but we, I did get cups and you can just pour them in and John and I can taste them. I didn't taste them yet, it'd be a live experience. <laughs> it could be very disappointing, but it could also be very fun and, and enlightening. So I'll set those aside. You wanna move down to the... Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, please. Be great. Before we start, let's ask, who are you wearing today? What is this fashion choice? Me? Yeah, <laughs> sweater on the, oh. sweater on the bit. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, uh, this this mead is wearing a ten dollars sale sweater <laughs> that I bought when I was in high school, um, and is very stretchy and very big, so it fits around the stomach. <laughs> uh, I can feel the top back on this, actually. So this is uh, a mead made with locally sourced honey. Um, it's about 10 gallons in these demijohns, uh, and this too is wild fermented. Um, a couple months ago, I did a podcast episode with Basic Burn Radio where I covered my process for creating a wild yeast starter that selects for highly fermented yeast uh, and mitigates the risk of enteric bacteria entering or anything that may um, spoil your meat. So, basically, what I did with this was I took uh, some honey, mixed it with some boiled water, some yeast nutrient, and put it in an Erlenmeyer flask um, on a stir plate, and with the with the top just covered with cheesecloth, so we can get some oxygen exposure. Spun that up for somewhere between uh, one and two days um, until I was seeing and smelling fermentation activity, where I put an airlock on and kept it on the stir plate. Um, grew that up into like my one liter size, uh, had it sit for a month because after a month, um, anything that would uh, sort of enter into your starter that may not be ideal, um, they tend to die off pretty quickly at about a month. So at a month, did some sensory evaluations on it, some um, aroma and flavor sensory, um, and then decided to step that up into the one liter up into a one gallon starter. And then did the same thing, made sure that I was still uh, tasting and smelling similar things after that, that starter had finished uh, 
fermenting and then added that as soon as fermentation was um, peaking to about uh, nine gallons of must. And so this is an OG of 1046, um, and that was the process on it. I think it's done fermenting now. It's trying to, like, as mentioned earlier, it can get a little cold in this room, so the sweater made a puff coat on it. Um, just because I was working with wild beast, I wanted to give myself the best possibility of success because it is a, it is a risky thing to to make such a large batch. Tem temperamental. With, uh, temperamental. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted just to, to maximize my chances there. Great. Yeah, wonderful. I am loving how it's turning out. You want to do the, this other one? Sure. This other one is very well one too. Um, similar, similarly made to when I was talking about the Rhode Island uh, apple and pear situation. This is an entirely um, wild cider, uh, just exclusively cider, about again about ten gallons. Um, this is a combination of apples that I foraged just from the, uh, around Burlington and St. Albans. Um, and a friend of mine who also had gotten really into cider this past year um, was tipped off to an old abandoned orchard. And so we went out there and picked a bunch of apples from this long abandoned orchard that had rewilded and turned back into essentially wild space. Um, so it was a great process uh, working together to have somebody else do the grinding um, and helping out with the pressing and all the prep. Um, and a lot of fun just to, to go out and look for these apple trees and, and pick stuff uh, and see how it turns out. And, and similarly to the other one, I pressed the, I pressed the cider and then I just let it sit, uh, let it sit rather and let it ferment on its own. And it's, it's very expressive. Um, it's not like, it's not too funky or anything. I'm really happy with that. The last thing we've got is something that I'm not particularly involved with, but if we turn around, uh, a former employee, Cody, had really balled out um, <laughs> and bought himself uh, an SS Brew Tech mini conical fermenter. Um, and in addition to the mini conical fermenter, he's got the small glycol chiller as well. Um, this is, we, when this came in, uh, we were just really cracking up because of how much it mirrors our professional setup. It's so, the, the valves, the butterfly valves are the same size as your professional setup. Yeah, so we're seeing but this on yeah. a 60 barrel tank, the same size fittings, right. uh, the same size. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it was cracking us up just looking at it and being like, right. wow, this is the true, uh, this is a true microbrewery. <laughs> <laughs> So it's cool. Cody's working on uh, seltzer recipes, hard seltzer recipes, um, and he likes to incorporate maple into those. So mm -hmm. bringing it back to a, a Vermont -y theme. Um, the two of us were always cracking up too about just how um, just how high tech his approach is and how low tech my my approach usually is. <laughs> uh, but we both really appreciate the science behind it and try and uh, learn as much as we can. So you know, or even though a lot of these things will be Pressed juice that is left to ferment. We are still taking pH readings, looking at readings, tracking it, and making sure that we have a high chance of success. Um, yeah. So we talked about boiling the bark, and with the same thing with the teas. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the flavor extraction at higher temperatures? And yeah. So I mean, even like there's there's always it's always a pretty nuanced thing. Um, so for the bark specifically. Uh, you know, there's conversation and lots of people can make it about whether it should be boiling or whether it should be simmering because at different temperatures you will extract different compounds. Um, so the one that's completely is just toasted. The temperature that you toast that, especially if something like oak, can bring out a wide variety of flavors as well. You can get really acrid things if you're toasting really hot. You can get a perfect like vanilla flavor. You can get a fruitier flavor depending on just the temperature that you're toasting. And it's a similar process when you're extracting stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I decided to boil. I read through this whole process and in making the syrup, I think I would simmer because you're gonna end up concentrating that liquid and then sweetening it. And I think that it could 
you didn't want it to be too, too accurate, especially yeah. but, um, and basic and how to show up. But I was, I decided to boil this because one, I wanted the largest difference between the two batches, one that is toasted, but otherwise unheated, um, and one that was kind of taken to the other extreme. The other thing is, you know, it's just a, it's a total one down experiment. If I don't like it, I can go back and try it again. And I'm not wasting too much. Um, and third, I really felt like the thing that I would extract would probably be tannins. Mm. It would probably be a little bit of that astringency. And at a low level, I think that could bring a nice, a nice mouthfeel um, and a nice backbone to these things. So that's kind of what I was hoping for. Honestly, you want to try it and then we can see sure. if that threw it out. Yeah. Okay. Two, I, I didn't have my wine teeth. I didn't bring it from home. So we're just going to have to pour. But again, it's a they're half gallon each if it happens where something goes wrong. It's not the end of the road. Just a little bit there. I have the boils here. And then you have the bark in the cup. I'll take the bark in the cup. <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, so here's your boils. Here's your right. boils. Here's my unboiled. Right. What are you here's starting with? Boil? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. That is Can you smell that bark? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. When I had initially, I would, you know, take it. And as it's fermenting, I, I love to smell the air a lot, and when I'm degassing, especially. And I wasn't getting a lot of that character, and I'm, I'm surprised at how much it's not processing. Just from the extra time in the bottle, you think? Or what's what's making the difference of the aroma from the fruit now? I think a bit of that. I mean, I think I also, I keep I keep uh, Tito's vodka in my airbox. <laughs> just so if it sucks in, it's safe, but it's not mm -hmm. like anything that's in there. Um, Wow. You do kind of you, you, sp you spin it around and you're smelling you're smelling a lot of it you're smelling a lot right um, that's fantastic this is really good there's so much like wood yeah there's so much smoke coming through with the flavor yeah that's... I'm I'm very pleased so that was yeah I just tried the boiled one yeah I tried the not boiled that's right a lot less coming through on the nose here I'm smelling I used for this I used. Um, Set the USO5 because I wanted a very neutral uh, yeast expression. Um, and this is only at an OG of 1050, so it's similar to a uh, beer OG. I love USO5 just for letting other things shine when I don't want a lot of yeast expression. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, we give it honest. Yeah, these are very interesting. So it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's still there. You're picking up. Almost more of like a pit, sort of like a stone fruit pit, in my opinion. Um, and maybe like of that of that light maple, where you kind of you're you're picking out that it's a wood thing, yeah. kind of like a maple sap. I mean, mm -hmm. so you can pick out that there's a bit of a of a tree base that we're of woodiness, but it's like not quite as forward. This to me, the boiled one is it's in your face mm -hmm. um, in a pleasant mm -hmm. way. It's expressive. And it's kind of, it, it has yeah. enough of the round character where you go like, yeah, I, I get that maple, I get maybe that oak, but what is this? It doesn't taste like anything else I've ever had. Right. Um, I think it's pretty sweet. It's pretty light, too. It's like, a, yeah, that's a really interesting combination. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's an ingredient that I'm interested in using more. Um, it's a tough thing to get. <laughs> to get. <laughs> um, and I was only able to uh, you know, I found the Asia Bark Tree, um, you know, confirmed the identification uh, myself with a guidebook and then with a botanist friend. And we went with it. Uh, but we were only able to get enough work to do a gallon. So, you know, it's a fun experiment. I don't know where this will go further. Um, but I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm happy we also got to taste it. Um, uh, so one more time, a reminder, if you have any questions about recipes or process or any of the things we talk about, you can submit it in the chat and we'll we'll try to compile something later on to, to give out to some people. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing to get to be able to share your process and to learn more and stuff. And right. I have found in the past with questions coming from customers that it allows me to dig in a little bit more. It allows me to 
to learn things that you know we might get a question I just I don't know but Ricky knows right we get to we get to figure out the answer we get to do some research um, it informs our meat making better it makes the products better so please reach out and let us know what you think if you got questions right yeah also because the scale doing a full scale is a little harder we get to really have fun with these kinds of things yeah this um, is the this is the like. Does it make sense commercially? Right. Uh, it's not a money making <laughs> Right. But it's a lot of fun and uh, it's great to learn mm -hmm. and to always be trying new things because, again, that always informs your, your meat making in the future. Because, again, to make a 2,000 gallon batch to collect enough bark <laughs> <laughs> to, to grind, hand grind enough uh, pears. <laughs> yeah, it's not, a, not necessarily fun. Right. But a lot of fun when you can get All right. Uh, I think Ricky says he's ready. Hello, my friends. You're welcome. <laughs> I have a question for Jake. What's up? What you got? Okay, so your hair is fabulous, and your presentation has the momentum of a runaway freight train. Um, Good start to the question. We like. <laughs> I mean, how do you do it? How do I do the hair? Um, yeah. Because the hair I mean, hair. you could take whatever part of the how can you do it. Someone <laughs> in here in the chat is going to be a huge Simpsons fan and know the reference, but also I want the legit answer. How do I do it? Uh, that's a great question. I channel all of my energy from my hair. So having the fresh cut, you know, it was obvious that this, this was going to turn into a runaway train presentation. Um, yeah, I've got a shout out Amelia, my partner, for giving me fresh cut. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like reducing a stock, right? So yeah. like all of your energy is now reduced against the top of your head, mm. and uh, so I. I it was just like I was losing the energy. You know, mm -hmm. The flow was, it was coming out of all the hair and it wasn't working. So. Dispersing into the. Dispersing into the. So, this is the one part we didn't coordinate. Questions for anyone. Uh, Jake's here to answer questions about his presentation. Um, John's clearly behind a camera. I was supposed yep. to be there, but I was just on a national event, so it wasn't. Um, and I, Jake doesn't know, he just got a thank you, shout out, cheers from James from Basic Brewing. No way. Uh -oh. Yes <laughs> way. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. This is like dream come true. I think I fanboyed enough during that, like, the pre interview. Um, yeah. I'm, thank you so much. This is like, <laughs> I, I hope this was a good presentation now. It's a lot of fun. <gasps> Whoa. Sam, are you doing that? Sam, that's magic. Uh, the questions okay. are coming up on the screen all big. Jake, have we played yes. with quick strains? Have we played with quick strains? Um, I have personally played with quick strains, not in anything here, but Cody uh, in the seltzer used Lutra from Omega. Mm. Um, he wanted something that was fast fermenting, uh, something that would produce a clean profile, even if the temperature was got a little hotter, despite his having a blood call filler. Um, and I think he was pretty happy with it. We were all happy with it. I've been, I've only actually used it in beer, but I've been very happy with his performance in beer. I love to drink lagers. Um, I live in a one bedroom apartment and so space is very important. And I have one closet that can kind of hit lager intense at the right time of year. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like to go with the quick strains for pseudo lagers just to uh, make sure it maintains a clean profile, even if you know, we turn up the heat to 70. And we do really enjoy Cody Seltzer as well, is that it's it's really comes through the flavor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He is also playing around with the idea of doing a coconut uh, seltzer right. and using the temperature expression on that yeast to push a little bit more of the pineapple mango mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and of the spectrum. Uh, so yeah, you, you know, there's a lot of fine tuning you can do just on your temperature. And does his there. new, so uh, Cody was a brewer with us for a year and has gone off to start a seltzer company. Does his company have a name yep. yet? Supreme. Yeah, he's, but, been, he's been working it. He's right. like, it was Vermont, it was going to be like Vermont no. seltzer company for a while. And then he was like, he wanted to do like Supreme seltzers of Vermont. Or, he's working on it. We'll, he's yeah. working on it. We will, we'll announce uh, in the chat yeah. when he's up and running and you get his reference. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. absolutely. Uh, question just, oh. Jess, you're amazing. Basic Brewing Radio asks, is the bark character similar to a barrel-aged flavor? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is similar. I mean, you're getting, you're not getting any of the, you're not getting any of the, like, previously used character. Like, you're not getting a, a bourbon thing. 
Um, if you were to taste it, honestly, when you, I don't know if people boil their oak prior to, uh, prior to adding it to kind of extract some of those tannins or get rid of some of that like chalky flavor. Um, I love the smell of that. Like I'll have the, the, the oak in the water boiling on my stove and I'm smelling that like vanilla, pecan, uh, that those sort of flavors, I think that comes across. I mean, shadow bark hickory is really good to the pecan, and I think that kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah, it, I wouldn't I wouldn't go barrel character. I would go God, like vanilla wood. Mm-hmm. It's, it's similar to bar- barrel, but I think it's distinctly different enough. Um, we actually have some barrels in the house that we're playing around with right now, and. I think this is distinctly different from that, but along the same vein. It's a terrible answer to the question. It's it's so on the fence, but I think that's about the best I can do. Like, I mean, that's, I but that's like a Jake answer to any question. Um, if anyone's yeah. a Fraggle Rock fan here, he is the Wembley of our company. Everyone loves him. He is the greatest. Just don't put a really specific question to him. Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, that's not true. That's not true. The other day I asked, do we need to replace the piston cylinder on uh, on this side of the canning line? And you said yes, unequivocally. So that, yeah. that's good. Those are easier. Uh, questions <laughs> where there are right and wrong answers. I like to take a much uh, harder stance. But I don't know. That's, that's sensory driven. Uh, you know, it's maybe today I, I'm getting less of that and maybe tomorrow. I mean, it's still interesting. Maybe tomorrow will be much more better. Yeah, there's a brewing process that is um, no longer practiced uh, commercially anywhere where uh, they would hollow out a portion of different types of logs and allow a three to four day fermentation. And uh, even then, apparently, like the souring component, and they would also use juniper. So like all sorts of wild things because there are antimicrobial properties that come out of the Arborvitae family. Um but yeah, I've never gotten to try one. And the same thing, someone was, I was reading something and they're like, does it taste barrel aged? No, it's its own thing. Still wood. So you're like, not, not barrel aged, but definitely not what you think of as barrel aged. Yeah, barrel adjacent is. <laughs> <laughs> if you I read if it one time with uh, the phrase uh, with kosher intent. Like we only bought kosher ingredients, but like we couldn't find kosher chicken for some reason, something like that. We're like, everything was made with kosher intent. I like uh, the phrase barrel adjacent. Barrel adjacent. If you had a uh, maple steer barrel, maybe that would come closest. Um, but yeah, and then additionally, just the last thing, maybe um, as things warm up, even up here in Vermont, we're hoping to start working some five gallon batch of, uh, you know, a fun sour mead to try it out. So we're trying to do um, a watermelon gosa style um, that will use lactobacillus in a, in the same sort of way that you would kettle sour a beer. Um, let the lacto do its thing for a day, make sure we're hitting our, our pH numbers um, and the sensory acidity, and then we'll, we'll fill everything there, add our yeast, and do our flavor. So that, that's the next thing on the docket after these projects move forward. Um, just thought it would be a fun thing yeah. to share. As soon as we bottle the gingerbread. <laughs> as soon as we, yeah, as, yeah we're, we're slow going. We trying. should also do these live things more often. I had no idea we were talking about a watermelon goza. That's great. And I wanted to thank you, Rivers. Uh, be very careful trying to drink along with me in videos. It's literally <laughs> binge drinking, um, which is the same as binge watching. So we got a question on the screen from Kyle. What is your favorite fruit to use in mead? Ooh, uh, I'm let each person answer. I want John to go first because he hasn't gotten to answer anything yet. Uh, I really like our blackberry. It's like, it's very fun flavor. It's very um, powerful in its identity, but it doesn't overpower other things too much. I, I really just like it. Um, yeah, do you want to answer commercially and personally? Because I feel like those are two different answers. <laughs> yeah, well, all of my commercial answers will be like, I would love to work with strawberry, but ain't nobody could afford that right. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
No, yeah, no, whatever, whatever you like to. I think that's your. The question is your favorite fruit to use. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, as you can probably glean from this conversation, I was really bitten by a spider bug. Uh, so apples, I just have. I literally have an apple calendar on my wall at home. I have a book called Odd Apples, which is just photographs of funky looking apples. Um, apples is my answer. <laughs> if I had to pick something else, I think Ricky's right along there with strawberry. You can do a strawberry meat really well. Um, it can be a fickle thing to have come across, uh, but if you can get it there, it's so enjoyable to drink in the summertime. It's so nice and pretty. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Ah. Oh. Mine's weird. I, I I thought I would buy enough time to be able to answer this by asking <laughs> you to. Um, so like, so the, John, you asked me like commercially. I love working with cranberry because cranberry is so forgiving. Like cranberry <laughs> is so forgiving. But I was tracing back through my mind, and so the question is like, what's my favorite? What have I worked with the most? It's actually things in like the orange family, like blood oranges through. Um, oh other like what? orangey citrus and if i wasn't thinking about a project we're working on i would have never considered that but like i've used orange peel um it goes into our winter warmer as part of a wassail set it's part of like it just shows up in so many things and it's almost like vanilla in baking mm -hmm. orange then becomes like the thing you're working around and oh, I see a pomegranate, and we yeah. wanted to launch pomegranate mead, and no one in the U.S. could supply us commercial volumes at the time. Palm was buying everything. This is like eight years ago. We haven't checked since, but we literally couldn't uh, get a commercial volume of it. And that's a really fun one to work with because of the tannic structure in it. I think orange yeah. is such a good answer, Ricky. I think it brings it in the same way that vanilla is used in baking, and like you'd add vanilla to something that is a chocolate dessert because it's just going to amplify it just a little bit. I think that orange peel and orange can work in that same way. It's a great answer. It's known as a tipa specific uh, flavor potentiator. Vanilla brings out sweetness and certain um, flavor, uh, flavor comp uh, compounds and aroma compounds, whereas salt is a generalized flavor potentiator and it makes everything taste more. Well, salt too. Yep. <laughs> I, I did have to I did have to cut Nora off from access to our salt pick because she was just like whenever we were baking, she just like eat little handfuls of salt, um, which probably isn't great for a four year old. The born chef though. That's uh <laughs> yeah, like oh yeah. Oh right, you're right. Uh John John was uh worked on a line too. Salt's what keeps you going. Oh, yeah. You're either uh, you're you're one of three things in my experience of cooking. You're a marijuana guy. You're a salt guy or you're both. I was a salt guy. Uh, okay. You're about as cold as us in Alaska sometimes. My house is about 60 to 65 for half the year. Question, can you recommend a good cold weather yeast? I can do even better than that, Marshall. Uh, there's an entire article on our blog called Too Cold to Brew, No Way. So I lived up until this year the only way we could heat our house was with a wood stove, which means that um, periodically I'd bring my baby girl downstairs, put her down in her little jammies, go start breakfast and come back. And one day I took a thermometer and sat it next to her and it was 36 degrees where she was. So that's great lager in temps. Um, we love to play around with different yeasts. And that's one of my personal there are there are honey people out there that they want to try every honey that exists. When I have used our polyfloral or wildflower honey with every type of yeast, then I'm going to be ready to switch to every type of honey. And I could I love people that go the other direction. They're like, I use D47 for everything. I'm going to try every honey. But um, as far as yeasts go, one of the things that people tend to forget is that Yeasts are designed, let's call it, for a specific task. And so we ferment very hot with a lot of our, excuse me, a lot of our yeasts because we're trying to get those secondary metabolites out of there. Because honey, water, and yeast with a super duper 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 clean fermentation at low temperatures with low ABV, 
uh, sort of tastes like seltzer. And if I had known that hard seltzer was going to be a thing, um, it, we would have been the first people out of the gate. But um, there, a lot of the wine strains are slow, steady workers. But the one that I have the most personal experience with at uh, outside of lager yeasts um, at extreme low temperatures for mead making is the Y yeast dry mead strain. It's a little pricey, um, but it is excellent at what it does. And there is a meadery in Vermont that I believe uses it exclusively for their products and they make excellent stuff. Yeah, I, I, I go to like 3470, I think, where it's a lager strain. Um, I think it does well in mead. I think it makes excellent lagers. And I would like to also add, thank you, Ricky, for talking about honey varietals. Something I would just, when I was walking through these and being like, oh yeah, this is a mead. It uses honey. Um, we use a wildflower honey in this, and I do the same um, for personal projects. Um, I love the ability to be able to get a wildflower uh, honey from Vermont uh, and kind of have that expression of the landscape um, through what's here wildly. Um, so yeah, that, all of the all of the means that we talked about today use uh, wildflower. Thanks for popping that back in my head, Ricky. <laughs> Okay. Ricky, do you have any new flavors coming out that will stick around that isn't a one-off or a seasonal? If not, do you have any one-offs planned? Uh, Jess. Is Jess on the call? Oh, Jess wasn't fast enough if she is. So we had, I had tried to get permission to talk <laughs> about this um, and it was up in the air. Kelly's also in a call so no one can stop us. Oh, there's <laughs> Jess. Jess, are we allowed to... Are we allowed to, ready, ready? Are we allowed to ease sure. it? Did you hear that, Jess? I did that for you. I did that for you, that pun. Jake, what series are we launching? Uh, I'm gonna turn that over to John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. Just cause I, it was, uh, it was just like, yeah. We are launching a T-line. Uh, with the first T being Smoke on the Mountain. Smoke on the Mountain. Uh, yeah. I don't know how far I want to go. It's going to be the yeah. black T. Okay. Um, that's, I don't know. I'm, I'm in front of the camera, but I'm not the person <laughs> that wants to say something that I shouldn't. So. Yeah, it might be uh, okay. so substantial. We're, <laughs> we're launching a T-Series, and in answer to your larger question, we have got permission from Kelly the Boss that if there are really popular things in the series, that they will slowly populate year-rounders. Jess, I did say a pun. I said tease it. And yeah. I got that from James at Basic Brewing. He he said, do you want me to tease your tea mead? And mm -hmm. I said, I will use that at Jess sometimes so she knows I'm willing to use bad puns. Um, anyway, yes. So we would love to have tea series. Um, so Buckland is technically... A tea meet, but it's so its own thing um, that it's not going to be in that series. It's going to be here for half the year, like it's always been. But anything that people really, really love, um, Kelly, many people probably don't know. The last job she had before she started this company was she was the manager of a high end tea shop, and uh, it's been a passion of hers. And we have slowly worked on getting a tea meet out for I don't know, it's coming on ten years now. Something like that. But yes, so those are going to be added. Um, and then we have something way, way bigger about year rounders that I can't tell you about yet, but I hope to any day now. Yeah, I'm not saying anymore. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob. Uh, so how about a favorite honey? Mm -hmm. So as I said, I'm a, a wildflower guy. I, I switched what region of the world I pull from. We're trying to work directly with a farm that can supply all of our honey now, uh, which is a big, big thing. Um, but uh, Jake and John, you do a lot more smaller batches than I do, small batches. So what's your favorite to work with? I have had, so I'm also a lot of flower guy. 
I use that almost exclusively, but I can't, every time I go to the store, I always check on the section to see if they buy any cool rides or anything like that. Um, the ones that I've really enjoyed using in the past, I went on a trip to Maine and I got a uh, Maine blueberry honey, which was really interesting. Um, I did, that was a wild ferment too, and that was the most aggressive fermentation I've ever had. I once it started, I the, the morning after I saw the first visible signs of fermentation, I went and just shook my coconut at once to degas it, and it you know very vigorously shot out of the airlock and hit my ceiling, <laughs> and I'm just like standing in my kitchen screaming, and my girlfriend's like, "What's going on?" I'm like, "It's not actually a problem, but it is a problem. This is I'm all cleaned up." Um, so the main blueberry uh, blossom was great. I really enjoy the Eastern buckwheat honey that's available here. Um, I did a, I did a, uh, a meet with that that we got to try in just the tasting a couple weeks ago, um, and it provides enough of that like wet hay horse blanket that if you use it in a third of your overall honey, that it, it provides enough of that to to really kind of taste like a saison um, without being like. Ugh. Um, I think it also would have paired really well with a uh, stone fruit like apricot or something like that to bring a little bit of brightness to the darker flavors. And then the final one that I really enjoy just eating, I've tried it in a mead and it didn't turn out too great, um, is not being honey. It's sort of the in between between the really super intense buckwheat um, and the like extra light amber wildflower. It straddles the line of being like you get strawberry and raspberry notes from it and you get some caramelized notes from it but you're also getting the super floral um and like stuff and i that just starting toast or just a spoonful of it is like i keep some around just as a treat you know, it's really great stuff now it's a big problem i don't know how they're getting on the honey or like I, I guess they're just capitalizing on a super basic plant um but it's delicious um What's our next question? Oh, Rivers, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, my camera's going to go off. We'll answer that question in a second. Um, Polish meads. Um, they're uh, John. Is the weird old mead bottle still in the kitchen? Yeah, it is. Do you want to <laughs> run and grab it and show it to Kyle? Yeah, we'll get our weird old mead bottle. Um, we have a couple of them around here. I've never brewed, uh, you know, the first time I've heard of uh, some of the traditional Polish meads was from our mead varieties poster um, that we had hanging on the wall at the meter. And just like looking at the ratios of honey to water and stuff, it's like this is there's so much here just to go off of in making, you know, like plain honey and water meat. Like this is a whole thing onto itself. And I just never had the opportunity or thought about doing it. And I really should give it a shot. But Kelly's I was gonna say Kelly's uh greatest regret in life, she once told me came from someone making a comment on the mead varieties poster saying, I love this, I have it up in my kitchen, but the Polish meads, how did you decide to organize those? They're not in alphabetical order. They're not in honey to water ratio order. And Kelly was like, I don't know. I don't. Why did I do it that way? So that was a gift from our first employee's parents who had acquired it in. Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, 1980, 1988 or so. Um, so by the time we had it, it was a, at least uh, 30 years old. And it had a plastic like cellophane thing under the cork. So we pulled the cork out, which was all shivered up. But like, thank goodness there was plastic underneath because it actually had held the seal. And we took photos of it. I'm, I could probably go dig them up. And I will say it was one of the best beverages I've ever had in my life. Like we were all like, I mean, I've had 30 year old meads and they usually mead has a good shelf life, but it rarely really holds up that long. Um, I once had a 
pull off of a $295 a bottle port. And this was better. So I've had one Polish mead, Kyle. And um, if I'm only going to have one, I apparently had the right one. And uh, uh, ask another question, and I will be back in a moment with a visual. I, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm like Polish as well. I can probably get in on this. My grandparents would be so excited. <laughs> Aesthetically, that bottle looks like it was buried for 30 years and then dug up. I could, I could see that. Yeah, it's like traditional. I totally, I, this is definitely the thing that I would say. If you gave it. so right. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> I've looked at it for like four, almost four years now. I've almost worked here for four years. And so it's just been on a shelf. Mm -hmm. And I've just I've always loved it. So it's cool to get the backstory too. Thanks for asking that question. Anything else? Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the Tanzanian honey we had not too long ago? Oh, yeah, we did have an opportunity to do um, a company who specializes in varietal honey uh, send us a sample pack. We got to go through a lot of um, honeys from around the world that was mm. completely different than uh, anything that I've had and anything that could be accessible, I guess, in this region. Right. Um, we had like some Tanzanian honeys, we had some like Brazilian honeys. Mm. Um, I wish I remember what they were called. That would know, right. be something that would be worth putting in the documents. Mm -hmm. and these are really interesting, really fun items. But it, again, it's, it was uh, on the spectrum from like just super light and fruity, and like it tasted like um, eating honeysuckle mm -hmm. uh, blossoms or lilac blossoms um, to something that you could have sworn was caramelized or you know smoked honey. Um, and there were just single varietals pulled out of different areas of the world. It was enlightening to, to get to see the variety. Right. Yeah. That was a fun day tasting those. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not so, Rivers, are you ready? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, but there's this book <laughs> coming out soon, not for <laughs> resale, um, that has 200. Uh, mead cocktails in it and I don't know which is my favorite out of there but I started writing it when Nora was born and she's uh, about to turn five so it will be released eventually um, it was supposed to be released at the holidays but the publisher had a glitch in their upload where all of the lowercase o's came as wingdings and we had a new baby at home and that just didn't couldn't get to the top of my um list of things to fix but yes it is a slim volume of mixing with mead cooking with mead and all those things and it's it's uh this is the very marked up version with all the do 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 do, do all the green notes that's a typo ricky things and so we should be making the edits in the next few weeks um but i will admit that if i we had a discussion of what actually qualifies as a cocktail today. Like, is Guinness with a shot of uh, Jameson in it a cocktail? And I would I would argue that it's not just because you got to draw a line somewhere. Um, because then, like, a bourbon barrel stout would automatically be a cocktail. But if that's a cocktail, Valkyrie's Choice uh, with Brandy is... It would be my go-to drink, but... If I if it's like all the way to full cocktail, I have a drink that I make with Blue Ruin, uh, Bombay Sapphire Gem. So it's about an ounce of that, squeezed lime, um, which Nora loves to do. Her knives, Jake can cut um, citrus. Apparently, I learned uh, it does spray her in the eyes, but it's worth it apparently for her. Um, and so a slice of lime. Usually, I'll throw in. Um, I have, uh, I, I once did maraschino cranberries, uh, like an entire jar of them, thank goodness, because it took me forever, but they last forever. So they had to hand prick all these fresh cranberries, but a couple either maraschino cranberries or true maraschino cherries, um, splash of Peychaud's bitters and Nordic farmhouse for an actual cocktail on the rocks in a highball. I think I have a photo of it in here. We have a department 
Ted's question that was like, what's your go-to cocktail or something like that at one point? And I am not a cocktail person. Like, I don't understand how to build one. Um, I can't mix one. I don't know what to do. So if I'm ordering a cocktail, I go to the bar and then just, like, freak out. <laughs> get anxious and then I just go uh, old fashioned blurt out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just blurt out old fashioned. So really that's my de facto, that's my go to. Um and once Nate uh who was a uh, bartender and uh is a mixologist uh was really making fun of me because I was trying to explain how I had made a mojito but I used like the wrong type of rum. I use like a dark rum. I don't even know what rum goes in a mojito. <laughs> Okay, no, no, no. I remember this. I remember this verbatim. I was there. He's like, oh, I made a mojito. And it's like Nate's favorite drink. And Jake was like, yeah, except I used, uh, I didn't have white rum. So I used uh, uh, black rum. I used crack. And I didn't have lime. <laughs> so I used lemon juice. And, oh my God. Um, I, I didn't have mint. So I put in basil. Yeah. And like, basil? And he's like, I'm yeah. Very much a cook <laughs> where I feel like I can make a, a substitution in a dish. When it becomes a drink, for some reason, everything goes out the window. It's like citrus and citrus. We're going one <laughs> instead of one. And maybe uh, I can see this drink working. It's just so distinctly not a mojito that I'm offended that you said. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I did custom drink design for bars when I was living in the Midwest and it was the worst paying best job I ever had. I don't think I ever actually got money for it, though I was supposed to on a couple occasions, but I got to eat at the restaurant for free for a week. And then they would inevitably be like, oh, I'm so glad you worked so hard to do uh, a rose extract cocktail for our Lebanese restaurant. Um, but people keep ordering the incredible Hulk shot that we had on the old menu. So we're switching back. Um, but I had one that had basil in it and I was just like, I, I struck it from their menu. Cause I was like, there's no way you can, you can get it right. And Jess wants me to talk about the cocktail for this event, which is exactly what we're talking about, which is a build your own mead cocktail. So it's, it's, it's a choose your own adventure, but that is trademarked. Um, oh, but you do it yourself. Is it a service mark? Anyway, um, so it's trademarked. So it's called a choose your own it's own saga. And this is how I build a drink when guests come over to my house, unless I already know their tastes. Um, that was my one thing. Anyone have that really, really useless skill where you have something that uh, I know James has this for um, theme songs from shows from his childhood. I have that too, but uh, at one point, I realized that I could remember what every single person had ordered at every single meal I had been to for the previous 10 years, where they were sitting and what they had ordered. Can't remember customers' names, but I could remember that. The most useless information that my brain would hold on to. But then when I was a bartender, it was this amazing skill. People would come in and I'd be like, hey, last time you were in the restaurant, we you had the cheese plate, but we've actually switched from Havarti, which is what we had on the menu then, to uh, Gemost. And people are like, how do you know that? I was like, I don't know. I could have memorized the charge of the light brigade by now if my brain wasn't filled up, filled up with this crap. But I could. So uh, I had about 300 people's drink stored in my head. Um, according to my father-in-law, the guy at Harry's American uh, had an estimated 14,000 people's drinks stored in his head which is one of those uh things that is just mind-boggling but anyway um if someone comes over to my house uh in a non-covid world and my job is to make that person a drink i have a uh formula i use which is what's your drink of choice so most people will have a drink and you start with, so if they're a gin person, it's going to be a gin drink. There's the, no one who is a gin person will pick something else. So you start with that liquor and then the sort of um, fractaling occurs. And you go, what is your, you know, it's, it's the middle of the summer. What do I have in the house? And so this 
Saga, I know we have a ton of homebrewers on the call. And this is what I did before I was pro. Basically, I had all the base liquors, and I'd go from there. So this drink is my go-to version of the Choose Your Own Adventure, which I was just talking about, which is one ounce of brandy, two ounces of Vonnier, six ounces of Valkyrie's Choice. All the flavors come through. There's a like richness to it. It's the middle of St. Patrick's Day. We're still we're still not hitting three, four, five ounces of liquor in a in a drink. Um, but the nice thing about those proportions with the ancient collection and the craft collection is that pretty much however you align them, they work. It could be one ounce of gin, two ounces of headgear, five ounces of psychopomp, and you got a hell of a drink there. And then you'll know what garnish goes with it. But it's a great way to use your homebrew. Yeah. Don't, don't ask Jake to make you a drink. You can't always assume. Yeah, no. <laughs> What's our next question? So winter warmer is winter themed. Any more plans like that? Like Halloween themed? Maybe some... Oh, no. Okay. So, Rivers, pumpkin themed. Not your fault. Not your fault. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, where pumpkin chunking is held. And my parents own a video production studio in which the pumpkin chunking, pumpkin chunking video um, was duplicated over 10,000 times and released at the event. And there's a pumpkin chunking song. And so, pumpkin flavored things... I just, I just can't, I can't, uh, it's no one's fault. Uh, though, if anyone's a small, uh, uh, SNBC fan, Saturday morning breakfast cereal, he has a whole thing about how the exact same spice collection that's used for pumpkin pies is also used for like making ham and a bunch of other things. And he's like, we could have lived in a world where people would walk up and be like, Hey, I'll have the ham latte. And then someone would take a sip of it and someone else would feel morally obligated to be like, you know, there isn't even any pork in there. What? It's just the spice blend, man. It's just the ham spice blend. Um, so yes, the answer is the wild hunt is a fall seasonal for us, though the wild hunt occurs in mythology throughout the winter. Uh, usually it can occur anytime, but it's usually in Scandinavian and um british isle lore uh fall through winter it shows up if i remember correctly earlier in the season on thunderheads in uh in u.s mythology uh best immortalized as the ghost riders in the sky um the same myth just translated so Wild Hunt is a fall seasonal. We originally had Buckland associated with our uh, What the Fuck is Up with Tom Bombadil party. And it was so popular that one of our former brewers, uh, who's now a professional classical composer, which is great, um, he made it a condition of his employment that we make it a, a full seasonal rather than for one event. And uh, it moved over, and we have it from May to when Wild Hunt comes out. This batch of root rivers says they're trying root of all evil maple edition for the first time tomorrow, and it is uh, the, one of the first things that James from Basic Brewing ever tried for me was a maple uh, braggot that I had made, and it was I just used way more maple than anyone could commercially use. And I, the first thing before the one I sent to him fermented completely dry. And I was like, Oh, maple trees. When you take all the sugar out of maple syrup, it tastes like the inside of a tree. And so we learned a big lesson from that. And what this did was it just brightened that ginger through the roof. Like there's this amazing, like woody background. You'd think that we had aged it on wood and that all comes from the maple syrup. Do we have a next question, Samwise? But it's a it's a non-brewing related side project. But the current I'm also currently working on mm -hmm. sap. Sap is flowing in Vermont. It's my first time making maple syrup and I'm feeling like a true Vermonter. <laughs> Going to the tree. Uh, do you 
Do you want to tap our trees, Jake? I only have one bucket. <laughs> okay. I'm borrowing it from a friend who has two, and he has one bucket on his tree and my bucket on his tree. So maybe okay. if I really find that it's like the thing that I want to do. That's a great offer. Thank you. Uh, what is one ingredient slash fruit slash adjunct you wish you could work with? Uh, any grain. I would love to make a braggot in-house. Um, in I am making a braggot, but not in-house. Um, but I would love access to, a, um, that. I mean, there's just so much you can do. 5%, 10%. Um, I would love to use, uh, you know, chocolate malt in two percent of our our liquid volume ratio just to add some color. Um, I'm not going to pour caramel color into a batch to get that richness, but yeah, there's so much you can do with malt that you just can't can't do. I think we have a lot of like apricot or passion fruit and things like that that we would love to work with, but it's just too expensive to to get in the bulk we would need. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I really loving wine right now, so I'm going with grapes. Yeah. Um, but there was Slate Point Meadery over somewhere in New York, they did a, um, a mead with toasted oats, um, and they got around like TTB stuff, I guess, by aging it on toasted oats and not using it as a sugar component. Um, and I, it's like called the camper or something like that. So this March, you know, thing, and I was just like, what an idea! <laughs> what an yeah, idea. this is awesome. Um, yeah, can it lactose? Yeah. Oh, so just so everyone knows, the reason we can't use grapes is we're a kosher facility and grapes are their own special class of fermentable. Um, so we've all brewed with them at home. We just can't do it on a commercial level. And then um, the lactose thing is um, Jake and I don't want to have to list our product as being brewed in the same facility as things containing milk. Um, it's great to work with, but lactose intolerance is real, people. Um, what is everyone brewing at home, if anything, or what would be next? Uh, well, Jake, are you brewing anything at home, or is everything in the brew closet? <laughs> well, I'll be moving in a month or two, so I figured that this would be a great excuse to bring everything that was in the one closet in my apartment <laughs> to the facility. So uh, this is everything I've got going on right now. But I have a lot of things uh, stored in the freezer that I want to turn into uh, various projects. I've got rhubarb, I've got local plums, I've got pears, so I've got mulberries, dandelion petals. I've got, I always, it's easy to collect a lot of these things to see at the store, to be out and foraging and be like, oh, I can make something with that and just lose the time. So I've got a stockpile of stuff. But those are, those are all the ingredients that I'm planning on bringing Sure. John, you brewing anything these days? Uh, no, just the kettle sour is what I'm excited about. Um, I'm actually working on a top secret project, so I'm not brewing, but we are partnering with partnering with a distillery, and I've gotten to play around with some of the products that they're developing with us. So that's that's my my new cutting edge frontier. Oh, Jess also wants to know what everyone's favorite hard alcohol is. Everyone being Jake, John, and Ricky. Uh, whiskey, and probably. Whiskey? Whiskey for me. Uh, Ricky, you go. <laughs> well, mine is I had a neighbor uh, in my first house that, that Kelly and I lived in. Her name was Sarah Runchy, and we met one lovely spring afternoon and I walked over to her house and I said, Hey, cause I was a beer brewer at the time. Are you a beer drinker? She looked at me and she goes, I don't like to say I'm a beer drinker. That's a, that is a level of 
prejudice that I just don't have. I'm a drinker. And I said, Sarah Runchy, you and I are going to be friends. And we have been friends ever since. So I don't have a favorite, just like uh, if you ask me what my favorite movie is, is it during Christmas? Is it in the middle of the summer? Um, I'm very seasonal in all of my eating and drinking and music and everything. So right now, um, I've been, yep, gin in the summer. Yep. Um, uh, I have gotten to uh, try something that you can't buy, uh, which is the base liquor that becomes brandy. So it is a white liquor, uh, in this case made from honey. Uh, spoiler. Sorry, I should have done spoiler alert. Um, hashtag, do I have to say hashtag first? Um, so that's been really, really cool because the honey really comes through and there's someone out there now, uh, they call it you know, Y-E-N-O-H. Uh, they're making a really strong, uh, like aroma and flavor profile honey, like in the vodka direction. Um, really, really excellent, really cool to play around with. So that's my go-to right now, simply because uh, it's what I'm experimenting with. But uh, John, historically, I would have said either brandy in the winter or whiskey in the summer guy. I didn't listen to what you were saying at all, Ricky, because I've been trying to figure out what my answer is going to be. And I think, uh, alluding to my lack of understanding liquors with the cocktail thing, it would have to either be whiskey, tequila, or gin. So, I don't know, it depends. It's, it's, it's not my start. <laughs> That's basically what, what we were all saying, is that it, it depends on the season. I take uh gin and put san pellegrino like the little sodas like the orange soda that's a very good drink i like that i can ferment stuff i can't mix stuff <laughs> i'm new to mead do you guys participate in mead fest is that the one in north carolina i think so we probably there's one oh, in Killington this weekend. That's just a Brewfest. Wait, there's a meet event in Killington? Oh, Brewfest, right. Yeah. Yeah. Brewfest. Okay. Uh, so yep. specifically me, uh, hold on, hold on. Yep. Uh, North Carolina. Um, we do not. Though we could. Oh, it's hosted by Starlight. Oh, oh it's like a whole thing. Oh, man, I didn't know. Super cool. Would it be possible to take Bragi and distill it into a brandy? The answer is absolutely. You can't do it legally in the United States at home, but um, you could buy a still, and I don't have to know whether you own it or not. <laughs> uh, we haven't, uh, the the distillery we're working with hasn't played with Bragi yet. They've worked with Old Wayfair, um, what we call base. That's the the things that eventually become Valkyrie's choice. Um, we also have ancient base, which is Bonnier. So they played around with some of those. But we had a good experience using Psycho, uh, Psycho Pomp as well. Right. Uh, made the like really cherry. Uh, yeah. Did, yeah, that one was crazy. Crazy how much the cherry went through. Couldn't believe it. It was, it was, it was also super weird because of course it's crystal clear when it comes out of a still. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just wild. Right, but so much of the cherry came through. I was really, I was really happy with how that turned out. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> this is nice. No one's asked you any really embarrassing personal questions yet, Jake. It's an ask me. Legally obligated to answer them too. <laughs> so yeah. legally obligated. I mean, I guess we started by talking about your haircut, which looks great. Yeah, so that, yeah. that's a personal question. It's easier to not wear a hat these days. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to contend with everything in front of my face. So if there are no... Oh, yeah, I was going to say that's it for questions, it looks like. Um, it is 65 degrees here. 
why are Jake and John so amazing? Um, <laughs> I don't know. John, why are you amazing? Uh, a lot of reasons. It, uh, you wake up amazing, go to sleep amazing, eat breakfast yeah. amazing. You know, it's just part of the lifestyle. Uh, Jake, I know, takes a treatment for it. His mm -hmm. amazing is, is prescribed. Right. The prescription is jorts. <laughs> Wear them, and uh, you'll be amazing. I did. I saw the forecast today, and I came here knowing that we weren't having a production day, knowing that we were going to be doing this, and I did bring the jean shorts just in case uh, we get outside. So um, that is actually what I was about to say when we I said we have no more questions. So it is sixty five degrees here right now. Um, if you guys are looking for an outdoor activity. So uh, if people, it hasn't been shared, it's, it's on our blog, but I don't think it's been shared anywhere else yet. Um, just the number of initiatives um, that we've solely been rolling out in, to support our environmental mission. One of the things we're doing is the previous owners of the building did what everyone does, and they just threw a whole bunch of stones down and did so that they didn't have to deal with it. But we're going to be installing uh, community garden beds in that space. So if you want to get outside and have a fun activity, um, you can start scraping up all of that gravel and we're going to use it in our bioreactors that we're working on as the base layer. And you can also, uh, Audoom did check, um, you're allowed to also go in the woods. There are no dead bodies back there. Oh, I've been going, yeah, I, I go back there. Great, so you know. It's the we have the stream back there for anyone who doesn't know. There's this beautiful stream, there's some beautiful woods. I built a tranquility platform there last summer, which is just a little like piece of wood that overlooked the stream that you could sit and meditate or just relax at during lunch. Uh, tranquility Woods, as far as I'm concerned, is a great place to be. So it's good to know when we can go back there. Yeah, so anyone who hasn't read that article, the entire uh, point of it is that we are the laziest human beings on the planet and the thing about taking care of these woods is that you just don't do anything like if you want to do something other than like maybe make a little platform i maintain a tiny little trail so the kids can get back there safely like just don't do anything and you are helping the planet nature will take care of itself and so we're going to be scraping up those rocks so we can get green and growing things again and this was great we should do these more often yeah, last. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to my rambling truck, uh, presentation. I appreciate it. That was great. I learned so much about what you're doing. Um, I'll see you tomorrow, and I'll find out in person. Uh, yes. Action through inaction is what Brian says. Thank you. Bye, Brian. Um, yeah, action through inaction. All righty, everyone. Bye, everybody. See you tonight. Bye.